response that we have some Indiana Jones fans in the house today. <laughs> I used to really enjoy watching Indiana Jones uh, growing up. He, it's really cool that he's always looking for the lost treasure, always looking for that lost relic that had been hidden for centuries, maybe something beautiful like this, just a, a wooden chalice. Thank you, Ryan and Faith, for bringing this today from Uganda. Yeah, very, very special to have this here. <clears throat> well, Indiana Jones, he would uh, have to find ancient clues, travel all around the world and find these ancient clues and solve them and avoid getting impaled by booby traps, shot by bad guys, and of course, bitten by snakes. But I like the fact that he was always looking for the lost treasure the hidden treasure, rediscovering the lost treasure. And so this morning, I would like to talk to you about the lost message. I believe that there's a message that has been lost in America today and in our churches today. We hardly ever hear sermons on this topic anymore. We hardly ever hear sermons about this specific topic. topic. So what is this lost message? Well, I feel that is the, the lost message of Repentance. We hardly ever hear sermons about repentance anymore. We hardly ever hear sermons that speak against sin and against uh, wrong living. And I know that this can be a very heavy message, and I know it can be pretty hard-hitting. So I want to try to keep it lighthearted this morning. I'm dressed like Indiana Jones. And uh, I'd like to begin and start things off with, by sharing with you some true stories uh, that I came across, some true apologies that people made to other people. And so in Indiana Jones fashion, I'm going to need your help in deciphering these codes, and I want you to help me to figure out whether the person giving this apology is truly sorry or not. Do you think you can help me do that? All right, I'll ask for a show of hands. I'll, I'll put up on the screen an apology that somebody made and then ask for your show of hands to help, me, to help me decipher whether the person is truly sorry or not. Because we all know that it's one thing to say that you're sorry, but it's another thing to show that you're sorry. It's another thing to demonstrate it. And uh, so the first one, we're going to start out with a very easy one, okay? We'll start out with a very, very simple one. A person was shopping in a store, and uh, after they came out of the store and they came up to their vehicle, they discovered that their car had been ran into and a huge dent was left in their car. How many of you have ever had that happen before? You came out and found out your car had been hit. Well, there was a note on the windshield and this is what it said. It said, hi, my name is Jack. I accidentally hit your car. Someone saw me, so I'm pretending to write down my details. Sorry, Jack. <laughs> That's pretty easy to decipher, is it? How many of you think that that is a good apology, that person was truly sorry? All right, good, nobody. That would be terrible. Um, this next one, I have to, before I show you the note, inform you that there was also a gift that went along with this note. It was a container of bacon, all right? So along with a container of bacon, somebody received this note that said, I'm sorry I slapped you in the face twice. <laughs> all right, this one might be a little harder to decipher. How many of you think that is a good apology, that is acceptable apology? Only a handful of you. All right, how many of you think that's not a good enough apology? All right, that, that is hard. That's a hard one to decipher because if the person had just slapped them once, that can maybe be forgiven. But the fact that they slapped them twice is difficult. But as the archaeological expert in deciphering codes, I'm going to go with that that's a good apology because there was the gift of bacon. <laughs> Bacon makes almost anything better. <laughs> Here's another one. Dear bike owner, on Saturday, April 20th, I was out late after graduating from college. It was too late to catch a bus, and I'm too broke to afford a cab, so I borrowed your bike without asking. It was a lusciously smooth ride from what I remember. Anyways, I'm very sorry I did not ask to borrow your bike, so I have returned it with a coupon for a free lava cake at Domino's as an apology. Cheers, 
bike thief. <laughs> All right, there's a lot going on in this message here, isn't it? All right, how many of you think that's a good apology? That's an acceptable, acceptable apology? Probably about half of you. How many of you think, no, that's not a good enough apology? That's pretty, pretty split on that one. I mean, he did return the bike, but uh, I'm going to go with no because the gift was not bacon. <laughs> How about this one? My horse Tic Tac peed on your car. Here is $50 for cleaning. My apologies, Stan. <laughs> How'd you like to walk out to your car and find that on your car? <laughs> so how many of you think that's a good apology? He made reasonable effort, gave him $50 for cleaning. How many of you think that's not a good enough apology? <laughs> nothing, nothing can take care of a horse urinating on your vehicle. <laughs> and this is the last one. This is an actual ad in a newspaper, somebody who put this in the paper. Driver who beeped at me for going out of turn at four-way stop, 13th and Belmont, 6 p.m. Thursday the 20th. I was wrong, you were right, sorry. <laughs> now is that an apology or what? <laughs> to put it in the newspaper, you don't even know who the person is and just hope that they, hope that they see it. So saying that you're sorry is one thing, showing it is another, and this is where repentance comes in. And I feel that this message of repentance is a very important message, and honestly, I feel that it's urgent in America in the time in which we are living in. I have been alarmed at some of the stuff that I've been hearing from other Christians, things that are being taught in other churches um, across America, things like, uh, teachings like, you don't need to repent in order to be saved. That is one of the teachings that that is going through churches and is quickly gaining acceptance and popularity. They're saying that you don't need to repent in order to become a Christian. And that's a very dangerous teaching as we're gonna look at this morning. So we're gonna look at this lost message and, and rediscover the hidden message of repentance. I apologize if this seems basic this morning, if it seems kind of like very basic. This is just the direction that I felt God wanted me to go today, and so that's, that's what I'm doing with. So we're going to begin at the very beginning and talk about the word repentance. What does that mean? What does the word repent? If you look up the word repent in the dictionary, it basically will tell you that you feel remorse and that you feel sorrow for something that you did. I want you to know that that is not the biblical definition of the word repent. The biblical definition of the word repent means to turn. It means to turn back or to turn away from. The Hebrew word shub, which is where we get the word repentance, it actually has a double meaning. It's kind of cool because it means to turn twice. It means to turn away from and to turn towards at the same time. Repentance, therefore, is turning away from sin by turning towards God. The Bible makes this very clear to the prophet Ezekiel. In chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Repent and turn away from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. That word repent and turn is the same Hebrew word shub, meaning to, to turn away from. Turn away from your idols and your faces. Again, in Ezekiel 18.30, repent and turn away from all of your transgressions. Again, the word repent and turn, the same Hebrew word, shub. And God says through the prophet in chapter 33, verse 11, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. I need a couple of uh, helpers this morning. I talked to Ryan and Dave Plank, if you guys would come help me. I need one person, one more person. Dad, would, would you mind working on your day off? <laughs> if you guys could come stand up here on the stage. Ryan, stand here in the middle. Dad, if you could stand here. And Dave, stand right there, right? Ryan, could you turn and face towards Dave? Dave, face towards Ryan. All right, Ryan is gonna represent himself. Hi, Ryan. <laughs> Nothing against you, Dave, but you're going to represent sin, <laughs> right? And Dad is going to represent God. So the Bible, according to the Bible, this is how we start out in life. When we are born, we are a friend of sinner, and we are a friend of sin. That is what we are. We're born into sin. 
And over there is God wanting a relationship with us. Now, when Ryan hears about Christ and he hears about God, he decides to turn his life around and give it to God. And notice, as he's turning away from sin, he's turning towards God. And the same thing is true if he turns away from God, what is he doing? He's turning towards sin. Now, Ryan, would you do me a favor? Can you face towards sin and God at the same time? <laughs> you can't. It is impossible. By turning away from sin, you, you are turning towards God. And when you turn away from God, you're automatically turning towards sin. There is no middle. There is no alternative. And that is why repentance is absolutely necessary for salvation, because you cannot be facing towards God and towards sin at the same time. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> to say that repentance is not necessary for salvation is absurd. The Bible tells us no one can serve two masters, for either you will hold to the one and hate the other, or you will love the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both. Um, in the Indiana Jones movies, he had to be very careful of traps. His movies are famous for uh, booby traps. I remember one scene in particular where he's walking across this tiled floor and he's holding this map in his hand and it's telling him which tiles he can step on that are safe. Because if he steps on the wrong one, it'll break and give way and he'll fall hundreds of feet to the bottom of this pit where there's these spikes sticking up ready to impale anybody that falls. And I think, I've often thought of that scene in regards to the Christian life, that we need to have the map of God's word in our hand at all times. And with every step that we take in life, we need to make sure that it is following according to the plan in God's word, that we're following, that we're following his map each and every day so that we don't fall into the traps that Satan has for us. So speaking of traps that Satan has set, I have come to notice a major flaw in the church today. And I believe that this is a trap that a lot of churches and a lot of Christians have fallen into. And it is this. We have substituted confession for repentance. We have gotten rid of repentance altogether, and we've replaced it with confession. Now, I want to say that confession is a part of repentance, but it is not repentance, and it cannot replace it. We all know what confession is. It's admitting your guilt. It's owning up to when you do wrong and say, yes, I did that, I did wrong. But repentance is turning away from that sin in an effort to not do it again. I believe it was a child. They asked them what the definition of repentance was, and they responded with being sorry enough to not do it again. And that's really what truly what repentance is. And the, th the thing that I see with Christians today is that we have gotten to be experts at confession. And I see people living in the same, they, they say, you know, I keep making the same mistakes, I keep going back to the same things, I keep doing the, the same sins, and they, they just go home and they confess it every night, and there's never any change. There's no repentance. Now, generally, I believe that the majority of repentance takes place at salvation. When you first come to Christ, you turn away from your life of sin, you come to God, you let him wash you and cleanse you, and you repent, you turn away from that lifestyle and you turn to a relationship with God. The majority of repentance takes place at salvation. From that moment on, confession is absolutely necessary for the Christian life because we're not perfect. And God doesn't expect us to be perfect. And we still are human, we still make mistakes, we still sin, and that is why God has given us confession to make things right. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John is talking to believers. He's talking to Christians. And, and so he has the full understanding that we are not perfect and that we're going to continue to sin as Christians. We are not sanctified completely holy yet. We will be when we see Jesus face to face. But as for now, 
we still make mistakes, we still sin, and we need to confess those things. I want to put it like this. Confession is for the occasional sin, but repentance is for the continual sin. If you can remember that, confession is for the times that we're doing our best to live for God, we're trying to live the Christian life, and we, and we sin. We make mistakes. But repentance is for the habitual sins, things that we do often and that we do maybe on a regular basis. We need to remember the difference because I think there are so many people that are confessing when they should be repenting. We have substituted confession for repentance. Now, I have gotten into some debates online uh, on Facebook and some other social media outlets. Um, some of the kids in my youth group have shared with me some of, the, some of the backlash that they have received from other Christians and who will, who will say stuff like this. Repentance was for the Old Testament. That has nothing to do with us today. I've heard people say that. I've also been told by other Christians Jesus never made people repent. Jesus never was condescending to people. He didn't condemn people. He didn't go around pointing out people's faults. Jesus was always loving and forgiving and understanding. He accepted people for who they were. He never demanded repentance from, other, from anybody. And my response to that is, do you even read the Bible? <laughs> You know, you only have to read four chapters into the New Testament to find out that is not true, that Jesus did call people to repentance. So I want to look at this message of repentance in association with Jesus' ministry this morning. I just have three quick points this morning. Number one, the message of repentance preceded Jesus' ministry. When Jesus was on earth right before he began his public ministry on earth. Israel was in a very dark time in its history. Maybe the darkest time they had been in spiritually in its existence. You see, there had not been a prophet from God giving a message to God's people in over 400 years. Over 400 years of silence from heaven that God had not spoken to his people. And God actually warned the people of Israel that this was going to happen. He warned them through the prophet Amos that there was going to be a famine of his word, a period of time in which God would no longer speak to them. And the reason that God was no longer speaking to them is because they were no longer listening. They refused to listen to God's prophets. They refused to listen to his commands and his warnings. And so God simply stopped speaking. So they had not heard a message from God in over 400 years. Two things happened as, as a result. First of all, religion became stagnant. Religion was all about doing the right things and going through the actions. There was absolutely no relationship with God. And we see that that's why Jesus had such a hard time getting through to the Pharisees because they were the religious experts they were doing all the right things. They were going through all the right motions, but there was no relationship with God. It was all about religion. It had become stagnant. The second thing that it caused was for sin to become rampant. The people had started breaking God's laws repeatedly without care. And why not? They probably figured God doesn't care anymore, right? God's not saying anything about it. He's not doing anything about it. Maybe he doesn't care so much anymore. Maybe the people of Israel started to think that God thought that maybe those rules were too strict. Maybe I was too harsh with the people. Maybe I should relax on the rules a little bit. Let me ask you, does that sound at all familiar to you today? Do you think that maybe the church has gotten to the point where we think that maybe God was feeling that he was too strict with the rules, that maybe he was too harsh with the rules that he set for us. Let me tell you, church, they are too hard for us. Those rules are too strict for us. That's the whole point. The New Testament tells us that God gave us laws that we can't follow so that we would come to Christ, so that we would see our need for a Savior and that we would come to him for forgiveness. 
Unfortunately, the people of Israel had taken God's silence as approval for their actions. And I'm afraid today, I'm afraid for the church in America, that we have taken God's silence of our sin as his approval. And that is a very dangerous place to be. So now Jesus is about to begin his, his ministry on earth. But before he does, God said, sends someone to set the stage. God sends someone to prepare the people's hearts to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so God sends a prophet named John, his name is John the Baptist, who went around Israel preaching a message. And do you know what his message was? His message was repent. The Bible tells us in John chapter 3, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So John comes on the scene and he starts telling the people of Israel, you need to repent. You need to turn away from your sin. You think that God doesn't see what you're doing, but he does. You think that God doesn't care about sin anymore. You think that he's relaxed on the rules, but he does care. He does see your sin and he doesn't like it. And you need to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king is coming. The Messiah is coming. And you need to prepare your hearts. Church, I want to tell you that same message applies to us today. Our country needs to repent. Our churches need to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We await the return of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's coming to earth. He's coming to bring his kingdom and to rule and reign. And we need to be ready. We need to be prepared for it. So John, be, so John prepares the way by preaching this message of repentance. And many people, it says, many people heard the message, they were convicted and they repented and they were baptized in water. Which, by the way, baptism is a beautiful symbol of repentance. Number two, the message of repentance permeated Jesus' ministry. So in response to those that say, Jesus never told anybody to repent, I want to tell you that the message of repentance was all throughout Jesus' entire ministry. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 says, From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus picked right up where John left off. And Jesus began his ministry with this message of repentance. And Jesus flat out tells us his mission on earth in chap Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In John chapter 8, there's this incredible story that gets me every time I read it. There's this woman who's caught in the very act of committing adultery. And we know the story. They, they drag her out of the house. They throw her down in the street before Jesus. They pick up these rocks, and they're, they're, gonna, they're getting ready to execute her because that's what the law says should be done. And they say, Jesus, what do you think we should do with this woman? And Jesus ignores them. He kneels down, and he starts writing in the sand in the dirt. And they persist, and they say, Master, the law says she, she should be put to death. What do you say we should do? And Jesus stands up and he says, I think that whichever one of you is totally blameless before God, completely sinless, you have the right to throw the first stone. And one by one, those men threw the rocks on the ground and they turned around and walked away. And Jesus looked at the woman and he said, where did your, where did your accusers go? Didn't anyone stay to condemn you? And she said, not one, Lord. And Jesus replies with this profound statement, neither do I condemn you. I've heard this story used in example so many times <laughs> from other believers that Jesus didn't condemn people because here is the perfect opportunity where someone is worthy of the death sentence and Jesus doesn't condemn them. But we didn't finish the rest of his sentence 
A lot of times this is where they stop. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. But he finished it, this sentence by saying this, go and sin no more. Now, it's not, it doesn't have the word repent there, but that is what he is saying. Stop sinning. Turn away from your sin. Another story in John chapter 5, Jesus goes to this pool, the pool of Bethesda, where there's all of these sick people, injured people, people that are dying. And the reason they're laying by this pool is because every so often an angel would come and he'd stir the waters of this pool. And whoever could be the first person to jump into that pool would be healed of whatever ailment they had. So Jesus walks into this area and he sees this man that's crippled. And he goes up to him and he says, do you want to be healed? And the man says, yes, I do. But I have nobody to help me into the water. I'm crippled. I, I'm lame. I can't walk. I have nobody to help me. And Jesus says to him, I can help you. Stand up and walk. And that guy gets up, looks at his legs. He starts dancing around. He starts running out. All of a sudden, he takes off running. He just starts running through the whole town. He's so excited. Well, later that day, Jesus sees him at the temple. And Jesus goes up to him and he says, look, you've been made whole. You're completely healed. And then he says to him, now go your way and sin no more, lest something worse happens to you. Repent. Eventually, Jesus got to a point in his ministry where he sent his disciples out to preach. And Mark 6, 12 tells us, so they, his disciples, went out and preached. And what did they preach? That men should repent. Let me ask you, why did the disciples preach that? Because Jesus told them to, right? That's the message that he told them to take to the world. So the, re the message of repentance permeated Jesus' ministry. Number three, the message of repentance proceeded after Jesus' ministry. So after Jesus returned to heaven, uh, his disciples continued on the ministry that he had started. In Acts chapter 2, G uh, Peter is talking to several thousand people. And I want you to keep in mind, these are the people that were responsible for Jesus' death, for his crucifixion. They were the ones who were yelling for Jesus to be crucified. And Peter stands up in front of thousands of these people and listen to what he says to them in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. After that message, there were 3,000 people that repented of their sins and accepted Jesus as their Savior. Just as a side note, as we are going through this series on the Holy Spirit and putting the emphasis on the Holy Spirit, could I offer to you that maybe sometimes we don't receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit, maybe because of sin that is still in our lives? Because Peter says, repent and be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' disciples went all over the country, all over the world, bringing the message of repentance and sharing the gospel of Jesus. As a matter of fact, the word repent or repentance is mentioned another 30 times after Jesus left earth in the New Testament. So let me ask you, do you think that repentance was important in the time of Jesus? Absolutely. If it wasn't, then how come it preceded, permeated, and proceeded Jesus' entire ministry? So why have we gotten away from this message? How has it gotten lost in America, and how has it gotten lost in our churches? Well, I think it has an awful lot to do with a snake. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? <laughs> Come on, you knew I had to throw that in there somewhere. <laughs> the Bible tells us now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field the Lord God had made. I want you to know that since creation, Satan has been working his crafty schemes, his deceptive schemes, to trick people into sinning. 
since his creation, since the creation of Adam and Eve. He lied to Eve. He told her all of these lies, and I want you to know the same things that he told Eve, he tells us today. And we need to be aware of that. He lied to Eve by telling her that God did not really mean what he said about not touching the tree, not touching the fruit. And he tells us the same things all the time. God won't mind if you do this. God won't mind if you do this one thing, this one, one time. Maybe he even goes so far as to say, you can confess it later. <laughs> he also told Eve that God wouldn't enforce the rules. God won't punish you. And he tells us the same thing as well. God's not going to punish you. God won't enforce the rules. He's not as strict anymore. Satan also deceived Eve into seeing all of the things that she would be missing out on. He tells her, if you eat of this fruit, you can be like a god yourself. And he tells us all the same things. You're missing out on so much if you don't get involved in these things. The same lies that the snake was telling Eve in the garden are the same lies that he tells to you and me. And I want you to know that he's setting a trap for us just as he was setting a trap for Eve. Satan is a master at hiding the truth about sin. He sets a trap with something that looks beautiful with a little bit of sin involved in it, and he's hiding the truth about what's going to happen. I mentioned earlier the story of when Jesus healed the man by the pool and how Jesus told him later in the temple, sin no more unless something worse happens to you. That guy maybe thought to himself, well, what could possibly be worse than being crippled my entire life? Do you understand the life that I've had, Jesus? Do you understand what I've gone through as a crippled, having to depend on other people for every morsel of food, having to beg, having to have help to even move around? Do you know what my life was like, Jesus? How could you say that it could be worse? You see, Jesus was always more concerned about the spiritual welfare of people than the physical. Yes, he took care of people's physical needs. Yes, he healed this man. But Jesus was far, far more deeply concerned about this man's spiritual well-being than he was his physical being, well-being of being able to walk. And I want you to know that Jesus cares far, far more about your spiritual well-being than he does about your physical and this man that he tells him, be careful that you don't sin because something worse could happen to you, he's talking about something spiritual. He's saying you could lose a place in heaven. You could lose eternity with me if you let sin separate, separate us. You see, Satan is so good at hiding the truth about what sin is and what sin does. We need to be reminded of it. The Bible tells us for the wages, the penalty of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life. What is it talking about here is not just physical death, it's also talking about eternal death. Because if the gift of God is eternal life, then the opposite is true, that sin brings forth spiritual, eternal death and separation from God. God says through the prophet Isaiah, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Sin separates us from God period. It always separates us from God. And the end result of sin, if it's not dealt with, is eternal separation from God. This is the trap that Satan doesn't want you to know about today. And this is the trap that I think, that I am afraid that many churches in America are falling into and, and have fallen into. So what do we do with this message today. I know it's a heavy message. I know it's hard. But you know what the great thing is? There's hope. <laughs> With God, there is always hope, and there is always acceptance. There is always love and forgiveness. Let's turn to Second Chronicles 7, 14. It says, if my people, who are called by my name, are we God's people? Are we called by his name? We bear the name Christian, right? We bear Christ's name. If they will humble themselves, this is the first key to repentance, being humble. 
We have to be honest with ourselves and with God by humbling ourselves because you cannot repent when you're full of pride. We'll humble themselves and pray. This is where confession comes in. Talk to God, admitting our faults, admitting our sins, admitting when we do things wrong, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That's repentance. Turn away from it. How do you turn away from it? By turning to God. Learn to seek his face. Make God the top priority in your life. Make going to church a priority that, that will not be missed. Make family devotion times a top priority in your life. Make Christian music and other Christian influences a priority in your life. Seek God's face, and by doing so, you will turn away from sin. Then God promises, I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. I know it's a heavy message. A long time ago, I told God that I would not give a message unless it was something that he had spoken to me. And I want you to know that this message hits me maybe harder than any of you here today. I'm not standing up here to condemn anyone. Not at all. But oh, I truly care about the spiritual well-being of our churches in America. And I believe this is a message that that we deeply need. Can I have you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? <clears throat> if I could have the, the worship team come back. In just a moment, we're going to sing... We're going to sing this song, O Come to the Altar. <clears throat> and here's, here's what I'd like to happen. Right now, I want you to just pray and talk to God. And say, God, is there anything in my heart that I need to confess or repent from? And I want you to ask God to search, to search your heart and to search your life. The psalmist prayed and said, Lord, show me the things that are hidden from me that I don't even know about. And here's what I want to do this morning. If there's anything in your life that is keeping you separated from God, that he brings to your heart. In just a moment, we're going to sing this song. And I want you to get up out of your seat and I want you to come up here to the altar. Because the word repent carries with it an action, a turning away. And here's what we're not going to have. We are not going to have people sitting in the pews watching other people come up here and saying, oh, I wonder what they're going forward for. Because Jesus said, whoever of you is without sin is worthy to throw the first stone. There's none of us sitting in these pews that are worthy of throwing any kind of accusation against anyone here today. And I'll tell you what else there's not going to be. When you come to the altar, there is not going to be any judgment. There is not going to be any condemnation. Only love and forgiveness and mercy and grace at the feet of Jesus. Because that's what he's offering. God doesn't care about the sin that you've committed. He doesn't care about what's the things that you've done. He just wants them gone so that he can have a relationship with you. I want you, I want all of us to have the deepest, most alive, radical relationship with Jesus that we can possibly have today. Do you want that, church? And I think that if we are all honest with ourselves and with God today, that every one of us would be here at the altar. I'm placing myself here at the altar today too. So as we sing, 
would you come to the altar even now? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Jesus Christ, and oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful, sing alleluia, Christ is risen, bow down before God, this morning I'm reminded of the story of the prodigal son who squandered so much of his father's love and resources. But yet when he came back home, when he repented, when he got back home, he found his father standing there with his arms wide open, ready to restore him and ready to receive him back into the family. And God, I just thank you that you are that father and that your arms are always open. Even when we turn away from you and we face towards sin, you're standing there right behind us with your arms wide open just waiting for us to turn around. And when we do, you take us in your arms and you break the hold that sin has on us. 
and you set us free. God, I thank you for these people. I thank you for this church this morning. I thank you for the display of humbleness in coming to the altar. And I thank you for the sincere desire of deepening the relationship with you. God, each one of us, we place ourselves at the altar today. We pray that you would search our hearts, that you would try us and that you would remove any unclean thing from our lives, that you would sanctify us, that you would set us apart, that you would wash us, that you would redeem us, that you would make us clean and white as snow. And we know that you can do that because of your son, Jesus. By washing us through the blood of your son, we thank you that we can be made clean. Lord, I pray that the things that we need to repent of, that we would repent of them, that we would turn away from them, that we would look back and remember that today, May 19th, 2019, was the day that I repented of this and I turned away and I got my life right with Jesus. If there's things in our life that we just need to confess, occasional sins, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to remind, be reminded of them, that we confess them and forsake them now at the altar. And as we walk away from here, that we would be washed and we would be made renewed and clean through the blood of your son, Jesus. We thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for not giving up on us. Amen. Amen. You may be dismissed. <clears throat>